Good evening, everyone. Oh, nothing like a little ABBA moment to open the evening. It's very theme appropriate for tonight, actually. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Puckhaus des Weicher. My name is Ian Kenny, and I'm the Program and Development Coordinator here at the John Adams Institute. For those of you who don't know us, we are Amsterdam's independent podium for American culture. And I'm thrilled that we could all be here together tonight, because tonight is emblematic, uh, in my opinion, of what the John Adams Institute does best, namely bringing you a thought-provoking program on a topic of cultural and political concern that will hopefully leave you wiser for the listening. And tonight's speaker, Jennifer Carlson, is the director of the Center for the Study of Guns in Society at Arizona State University. And her book, Merchants of the Right, Gun Sellers and the Crisis of American Democracy, gives us, at least in my mind, a completely different take on America's fascination with firearms from what we normally get in the media over here in Europe. And I think I share maybe a certain wariness and a perhaps lack of comprehension on this subject with some of our audience members. Like many of you, I am also not an American. And so this regrettable and somewhat regular facet of American life, the ubiquity of firearms, can leave us puzzled at times. When we think of this topic, names like Sandy Hook or the National Rifle Association pop up as big red flags, and we tend not to engage further than that. But Jennifer Carlson's work shows that the rootedness of guns in American culture is far more complex than lobbies and school shootings alone. Indeed, those might be the upsetting consequences of a much more grassroots, widespread, and personal relationship that Americans have with weapons. And I suppose that I got my first taste of that reality at a young age, but that it's only now with the gifts of hindsight and Jennifer's book that I've actually been able to kind of piece together the complex mosaic that is gun culture in the United States. Growing up in Canada, I distinctly remember two moments in my young life when guns and America became synonymous with one another, but no less mysterious, actually. And perhaps some of you have had moments like these as well. In the seventh grade, for instance, an American school group came north on exchange, our southern cousins driving up through the depths of winter, ostensibly to practice their French language skills. And while they couldn't make heads or tails of my Quebecois teacher's version of French, we students were able to get to know each other better and more broadly through those few days that we spent all together. While we exchanged stories, some of the American students referenced school lockdowns, which we had never experienced. And then they were shocked to hear that and asked, where are the metal detectors? Aren't you guys worried about a shooter? And we had to admit that the thought had never actually crossed our minds. And many years later, on a trip to Santa Fe, New Mexico with my family, we went to kind of an upscale downtown, downtown bistro for lunch. And while we were eating, a group of three men walked in, each wearing a holster on their hips, pistols gleaming. And I felt in that moment kind of transported to another time and place, maybe to the American frontier of cowboy mythology. And a kind of distinct dissonance grew within me at seeing weapons so casually and openly worn, maybe as decoration or, or as something more. A political statement, a sign of power, perhaps? And now, of course, I realize that there was far more at work in both of these situations than I uh, had previously met the eye. Armed individualism is on the rise, and if guns are such an inextricable part of American culture, then they are without question worthy of examination. It may be at times uncomfortable or foreign to us to do so, but it is an exercise doubtless worth undertaking. And Jennifer, of course, won't be doing that alone this evening. We have a wonderful group of participants to help us examine this problem from a variety of perspectives. Boss Blocher, an NRC journalist, joins us tonight as our moderator. And Boss spent many years wandering America in search of good stories from Washington, D.C. to the heartland. And I'm sure you'll all agree with me that he's the perfect person to introduce Jennifer in just a few short moments and take on her work. 
And at the end of the interview and Q&A, we'll be joined by spoken word artist Jackie Ashkin, who's prepared some poems for us this evening to help us contemplate this important social and political question through an artistic lens. But um, enough from me for now. I'll hand things over to the experts, and I will come back to you at the end of the program with a little more news about the John Adams Institute and what is coming up next. So for now, Bas, the stage is yours. Thank you, Ian. Um, good evening. Tonight, we'll be talking about one of the most fascinating and, as Ian said, most puzzling to many Europeans, most puzzling features of Americans, their relationship to their guns. The statistics are staggering. Last year, 2023, there were 42,888 gun deaths in the United States. That is one victim of gun violence for every 12 minutes. Those figures are the background of our discussion tonight. And I'm very excited because the John Adams Institute has invited Professor Jennifer Carlson to shine a light on gun rights and their impact on American democracy. And I think there's nobody better suited for this task than she is. She teaches at Arizona State University, and um, that's in the greater Phoenix area. And over the years, she's written a couple of excellent books on the politics of guns. And actually, I had already one at home, which is called Citizen Protectors. Uh, you wrote that in 2015, and it's based on interviews with ordinary Americans, and I put air quotes there, ordinary Americans, about their experience with gun violence, and not as victims, but as people who carry guns and sometimes had fired guns, even wounded or killed other human beings. And they were in fully in their right doing so, that is, in the American context. Citizen, citizen Protectors was, in her words, an examination of, and I quote, a world in which guns are a sensible, morally upstanding solution to the problem of crime. And that's the end of the quote. In this world, the National Rifle Association, NRA, is not a hardline lobby organization trying to stop any common sense laws to prevent gun violence. No, for these people, the NRA is more of a community service for middle America. And when I read that book, uh, of Jennifer Carlson, I was reminded of a quote in one of my all-time favorite Western movies, Once Upon a Time in the West, where Henry Fonda, as you may know, plays the villain, and he explains the power of the gun to the man who hired him. And he said, my weapons might look simple to you, Mr. Morton, but they can still shoot holes big enough for all our little problems. So. It's an Italian director who wrote that dialogue, but I think it echoes all through Jennifer Carlson's uh, research and books. Um, in 2020, uh, she, wrote, she published Policing the Second Amendment about how race pervades every inch of the American debate over guns. Um, we will certainly talk about that tonight because it's so important, and especially with the Black Lives Matter protests of the year 2020. Um, currently, she's working on a book with, uh, together with Madison Armstrong, um, a book that centers on gun trauma. And I guess the op-ed that she wrote for the New York Times uh, was a sneak preview into the main thesis of this book, I take it, that uh, the trauma that gun violence uh, causes should be front and center in any kind of gun policy. But tonight we will be talking mainly about another book, a book she has published this year, Gun, uh, The Merchants of the Right, uh, subtitled Gun Sellers and the Crisis of American Democracy. Statistics here equally shattering. 2021 saw a sharp spike in gun sales, almost 22 million guns were sold that year, and that was a rise 
compared to 2019 by, I think, a third, right? Uh, I look at you, you're the expert here. Uh, we will no, do, no doubt talk about what brought that sales peak about, but the book goes beyond uh, sales figures and statistics like that. Professor Carlson writes about a not so obvious function of gun shops. They are a marketplace where conservative ideas about individualism, about conspiracism, about partisanship are peddled to the customers, to the people who come to buy guns. They come to buy guns and they get gun policy free to go. And what I particularly like about her method in this book and her previous books too, is how she relates to the people uh, that feature in those books. I know she's a sociologist uh, by education, but the approach strikes me more as almost an ethnographer. Um, she seems completely open-minded to what her interviewees have to say even if it's obviously far from her own point of view, which she makes clear in the analysis when she ties it all together. And I'm very curious, for one, to find out whether her upbringing has gifted her with this wonderful uh, talent, so, so rare these days of, let's call it deep empathy, the ability to listen to people without judgment, or at least with a delayed judgment. Uh, and if you think I'm out of line bringing up such a personal uh, part, uh, the, her childhood, into this discussion. I dare say that Professor Carlson gave her readers implicit permission to do so. In a TED talk last year, she talked about how she grew up partisan uh, with a father that was such a strong devotee of the Republican Party that he told his daughter, all you need to know is that the Republicans are the good guys, the Democrats are the bad guys, and it, Again, that sounded to me like the old-fashioned Western shows where you had the good cowboys, the bad Indians, and the good cowboys could shoot better than anybody. Um, and I can see how a girl growing up in this binary household, because your mother was not amused when your father said that, um, would develop a political sixth sense, as you call it yourself. Um, in the preface to the last book, she likens the visits to her parental home as ethnographic encounters. <laughs> so that makes me very curious. And I think we can all benefit from that ethnographic sensibility tonight. So I give the floor to Professor Jennifer Carlson. Thank you so much. That was one of the most touching introductions I've ever had. So thank you for that. And, and the, yeah, and th thank you also to my dad. <laughs> yes, um, we'll get to him. Uh, so I'm so delighted to be here tonight. Uh, I'm especially excited to be here at the John Adams Institute. Uh, John Adams uh, played a role, well, the only role, as I understand it, in writing the Massachusetts Constitution, which includes its own Second Amendment provision. He was part of writing the US Constitution, which obviously includes the Second Amendment, which um, I'll recite it for you. It's a well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state, comma, and that comma is very important. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now, there is a bustling debate that still goes on today in the US about what this Second Amendment really means. What did the founding fathers really mean? Is this an individual right inherent in this natural right to self-defense that is universal? Or is it a collective right fundamentally tied to the militia? And we can certainly have that debate, but what is really interesting to me is that up until 2008, the US Supreme Court wasn't interested in having that debate. And actually that debate itself is a relatively new debate in terms of a bustling debate that really captures the attention of, for example, legal academics. And so something happens in the middle of the last century in the US to suddenly make the Second Amendment something that is the object of controversy, conversation, and debate. In the 1960s, the Second, uh, the Second Amendment transforms, and this is actually from the scholarship of legal scholar Jonathan Simon, from what he calls a dead letter into a living document. 
Suddenly, the Second Amendment seems to join amendments like the First Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment to actually be meaningful to the everyday lives of Americans. And what happens isn't that they finally read a history book about the Constitution, but rather they suddenly had sort of the coordinates of their everyday lives shifted in such a way that guns, gun crime, and guns as tools of self-defense suddenly became pertinent and personal. So the 1960s is the dec decade in which political assassinations, riots, gun crime, all arrest the American imagination. And so what Jonathan Simon argues is that as crime becomes a bigger and bigger concern, guns are increasingly embraced, actually, as a tool of self-defense and as an expression of individual empowerment. So this idea of the individual right to self-defense being so central to the Second Amendment really gets invigorated in the 1960s and onwards. And there's a statistic I often like to refer to to illustrate this, which has to do with public attitudes on whether or not handguns should be banned. So if you're concerned about gun crime, you should be concerned about handguns because it's not AR-15s, it's not assault weapons, it's not rifles, it is handguns that are involved in most, the vast majority of gun crime. But if you're concerned about self-protection with a gun, you should also be concerned about handguns. And so what we see in the 1960s is something very interesting with respect to American public opinion. The end of the 1960s is the last time that we see a majority of Americans saying they want a ban on handguns. Those two lines between who opposes and who supports a ban on handguns get crisscrossed at the end of the 1960s. And the trend lines continue until now, where approximately three quarters of people in the US oppose a ban on handguns. So I think that's a pretty, uh, pretty striking statistic to let sink in. And so when we think about sort of the meaning of the Second Amendment, while legal scholars may debate that, it's already somewhat been decided in terms of how Americans, or many Americans, are living their lives and thinking about guns and gun politics. And you can see a really brute kind of crude illustration of this actually um, with the National Rifle Association, which has been one of the organizations that has really, again, invigorated this idea of the Second Amendment as an individual right. If you walk into the headquarters of the NRA in Virginia, you will be greeted by part of the text of the Second Amendment, that piece that comes before the comma that has to do with the militia, that's cut off. It's not there. It's dot, 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 the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And so I think that says a lot. So my research, my research, uh, as kind of already intimated, does something different than most scholarship on guns in American society. So I don't start with the letter of the law, although obviously law and the meaning of law is crucially important. I also don't start with sort of the hard crime statistics. Again, very important for understanding this context, but not the whole story. Rather, my research starts with how people make sense, make sense of gun violence, make sense of gun rights, make sense of gun politics, and how guns enter into how people see themselves in relation to one another and in relation to the state, and how this informs their deeper sense of citizenship and democracy. And so what does it mean to say that guns are connected to citizenship and democracy? So especially with much of the rhetoric of, around the Second Amendment, we hear a lot about guns in the US as tools to resist, for example, government tyranny. So I want to make this really concrete for you in terms of what this means to connect guns to democracy. And so I want to call your attention to three data points that situate the larger argument that I make in uh, Merchants of the Right. So first, Nearly 40% of people in the US consider guns a deal breaker issue when it comes to deciding which candidate to vote for. So this has been driven by Republicans in the past. So it's long been the case that Republicans have voted uh, uh, specifically on guns in deciding their, um, who to vote for. But now equally committed uh, percentages of Republicans and Democrats won't budge when it comes to guns. Number two, nearly a quarter of Americans, when asked, accept that political violence might be necessary to, quote, save our country. A third of Republicans believe this as compared to 15% of Democrats. So unlike the last data point, there is a big partisan difference in this. 
But I think what's also important to remember is that this has increased across the board. So Democrats a couple years ago said um, about 7% said yes, uh, political violence might be necessary. Now it's double to 15%. So I think that's something to really take note of. And then third and finally, gun ownership is understood as a basic ingredient in the landscape of democracy in the US. And these data come from a political scientist named Alexander Falindra at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Nearly half of Republicans think that gun ownership is a sign of good citizenship. So if you own a gun, that, that is a sign that you are a good citizen. Meanwhile, over half of Democrats believe that armed private citizens are a fundamental threat to democracy. So pretty incompatible perspectives on the relationship between guns and democracy in the US. So what can we take away from this? Not only have guns become a super issue in that they drive political sentiment and mobilization across the political spectrum, but they have also become the prism through which people understand the basic coordinates of citizenship and the basic contours of democracy. And this is not just, again, in terms of people's beliefs about guns, but also fundamental divides in terms of how they imagine politics and political power. And this is a major shift on multiple fronts. So there have always been voices on the right that have attached gun ownership to the threat of government tyranny, as I've mentioned. But the dominant appeal of gun ownership has, at least for the last several decades, long revolved around the more immediate concerns about crime and victimization that frame guns as tools of personal protection. So gun carry has proliferated across the US in the last four decades as a vehicle of protection amid socioeconomic precarity. Millions and millions of Americans have licenses to carry guns legally in public, or they live in states like where I live in Arizona where you don't actually need to have a license to carry. If you can legally own it, you can legally carry it. So my first book, Citizen Protectors, explored these dynamics to unearth how many men have embraced guns as a means of redrafting good citizenship around the willingness to use defensive force. The book I'm here to talk to you today, of course, though, is Merchants of the Right, and it provides a way to more directly link up American gun politics to the politics of democracy. And so in this brief sort of opening, space for opening remarks, I want to interrogate this conversation about guns and citizenship from new angles. I want to explore, or at least start to explore, how guns are a means of asserting a particular relationship vis-a-vis -vis the state how guns actually open up space for everyday citizens to themselves police the boundaries of their fellow citizens, and how this entails distinctive imaginaries in terms of what democracy entails in the US. So I want to be clear that Merchants of the Right is a snapshot of a very particular moment in American politics and in gun politics, a precipice even, if you will. It focuses on interviews with 50 gun sellers across the US that were conducted in the midst of the multi-layered crises of 2020. And just to remind you, not that we necessarily need a reminder, but of what happened that year, in particular, the coronavirus pandemic, the Black Lives Matter protests and anti-racist uprisings, as well as, obviously, in the US leading up to January 6, 2021, increasing democratic instability due to concerns about election integrity. Now, reflecting the relationship between gun politics and insecurity that I uncovered and discussed in Citizen Protectors, gun sales surged dramatically in the US in 2020 and 2021. And there was something different about these gun owners. So whereas gun owners have typically and stereotypically been white conservative men who own a few guns, all accounts suggest that the new gun owners of 2020 and beyond were more likely to be women, racialized minorities, sexualized minorities, and even liberals as compared to existing gun owners. So perhaps as many as 8.4 million people became new gun owners, and so that's in addition to that figure you heard, or a part of that larger figure you heard earlier, um, that's just the people who became new gun owners. And approximately one in five, so 20% of American households bought guns. And this is in a country where there are already more guns than people, and where in some states, between 60 to 70 percent of the adult population owns firearms. So at the front line of this surge in purchasing were gun sellers who tended to be overwhelming, um, overwhelmingly conservative. They're in the business, quite obviously, of selling guns, but as they sell the firearms central to the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms, gun sellers also shaped how those rights were engaged and exercised. 
So customers coming into a gun store hoping to simply buy a gun might instead find themselves in the middle of a lecture on gun laws or on the ethics of self-defense or perhaps even chastised for not voting for Trump. So gun stores alongside shooting ranges, gun training, gun shows, and even pro-gun businesses adjacent to the gun industry like Black Rifle Coffee, which is a popular coffee chain where I live, uh, provide space for gun rights proponents to share and sharpen, sharpen their views. So 2020 offered gun sellers facing this surge of new diverse gun owners a very interesting choice to embrace a new, maybe even post-partisan chapter in the politics of guns in America or to double down on the mainstays of conservative thought. So in other words, it was a perfect opportunity to understand how people like gun sellers forge democracy in their everyday lives. So in these spaces, my research showed, gun sellers drew on very particular tools, and I'll, I'm sure we'll get to talk about these civic tools in more detail, specifically armed individualism, conspiracism, and partisanship in order to navigate their own responses to everything that 2020 entailed. So what this book wagers is that how gun sellers navigated and at times aggravated the breakdown in US democracy tells us something crucial both about why guns have become a more and more universally appealing tool amid democratic distress, but also why gun politics end up oftentimes reinforcing not just the political divisions that Americans experience, but also the kinds of distress that lead them to embrace guns in the first place. And so to illustrate this, I want to start with a quote from Robert. Robert was a white middle-aged gun seller from Florida, and I basically wanted to know from him, I was talking to him about what it was like to experience a surge of new gun buyers in a state like Florida. This is a state that is very conservative, it's very pro-gun, and it also has regular natural disasters. Um, all things that you would expect would make someone who wa was on the fence about purchasing a gun having already purchased, purchased it prior to 2020. And so I asked him, what is, what, how can you describe what is motivating these new buyers? And he says, when you have uncertainty, you have to have a guarantee and the only guarantee in this country is the right to protect yourself. So the uncertainty that Robert referred to echoed my previous research on gun carriers, faced with profound precarity and a feeling that the social fabric was unraveling before their eyes, Americans didn't know who to believe, and they also didn't know who or what they could turn to, but most certainly not the government. So remember, this is a country with a withered social safety net, no universal health care to really speak of, plummeting trust in public institutions, and very little sense of collective cohesion going into 2020. So amid this backdrop, armed individualism was embraced as a gun-centric civic ethic, a means of personal empowerment that presumes government incompetence, whether due to overreach or underreach. So for gun sellers, 2020 communicated this very clear message, quote, you are on your own, which is a quote from a gun seller. And it also provided a clear solution to those, to echo Robert's words, who are looking for a guarantee, get a gun. Now, as a vindication of this sentiment, gun sellers often reported with glee and delight, literally, <laughs> as you'll hear from the quote, the broad range of gun buyers that came into their stores, women, racialized minorities, LGBTQ members. Andrew, a biracial gun seller, for example, told me that he sold a gun to an Asian American whose relative, relative had been attacked on the street in what he described as a hate crime. Andrew connected the sale and others to an ethic of empowerment that he saw guns as carrying. And this is his quote. Quote, I tell you I delight when I put a gun in the hands of any marginalized or discriminated minority group. I believe that is exactly what the gun is for, so that they can defend themselves and stand as an individual, even against oppression, end quote. So Andrew illustrates armed individualism as a sort of liberatory ethic deeply suspicious of collective action and deeply pessimistic about the state, Andrew nevertheless exudes optimism about guns as tools of freedom, equality, and protection, not just but especially toward those minorities who have disproportionately been on the losing end in all of those regards in American history. There was one demographic, however, that did not inspire enthusiasm and an embrace of empowerment for gun sellers. And so whereas race and gender and sexuality may seem from the outside to mark the boundaries of who counts as a good guy with a gun versus not, gun sellers themselves actually turned to a different marking to describe who was worthy of and responsible enough to exercise their Second Amendment rights. And this was partisanship. 
So while at least one gun seller I interviewed uh, quipped that I will sell a gun to anyone who passes a background check, the fact was that actually most gun sellers were more circumspect about ensuring gun buyers understood exactly what they were getting themselves into and refused to sell if not. And so this really speaks to the fact that's often overlooked in, gun in the gun debate in the US that gun sellers are actually also frontline gun law enforcers. So much of the time this was couched in a sincere commitment to firearm safety, but this commitment to firearm safety also did double duty. So appealing to responsibility as a code word for partisanship, gun sellers drew lines around who, could, who should not be trusted to safely handle a firearm that were grounded in political bias, that is partisanship. So here's an illustration of that. Rodrigo, a white Hispanic gun seller in Florida, explicitly connected people's political stances to their fitness as gun owners. So this is a quote from my interview, and I asked him, you know, again, this question of who is it in Florida that's buying guns, right? Like, what is it about this moment? Who are these people who basically needed a pandemic to clarify for them whether or not they should purchase a firearm? And so he says, they are the people, all the people that people say shouldn't have guns, they are the ones coming in to buy guns. Everybody else already had their guns. I had a kid walk into my store with a Bernie Sanders shirt on, so that's the socialist politician from Vermont. I am very confident that I converted him to grow up in the little time I had him, and he actually left here thanking me for Trump. Now, I am not at all sure or convinced that that actually happened, um, especially in the way that this gun seller de describes it, but I think what's, what's really crucial is that Rodrigo draws this line between the good gun, the responsible gun owners and the irresponsible gun owners, and also puts himself in the role of political evangelizer, that he helps this kid grow up a little by converting him to Trumpism. And so this sentiment walks back on this ideal of guns as universal tools of personal protection and gun rights as inherent rights to self-defense. So instead, I found that alongside a libertarian thread that celebrated gun rights as empowerment for everyone, think Andrew and his delight in arming marginalized minorities, there was this illiberal thread that emphasized liberals and leftists as not just incompetent gun owners, but also as a threat to the project of, um, of, of gun rights, and thus undeserving of the protections and privileges of citizenship, which necessarily included the right to keep and bear arms. So as we head into the 2024 US election cycle, guns remain heated objects that do more than simply express a political belief. They enshrine a means of imagining democracy, of relating to the state, and of judging one's fellow citizens that, when charged with a bitter longing for a bygone America, threaten to unravel the basic threads that keep US democracy intact. So it is ultimately this underlying culture, a political culture that has led a majority of Republicans to now view the January 6th Capitol insurgency as legitimate protests, a supermajority of Republicans to believe that America has gotten worse since the 1950s, and a third of Republicans to view political violence as potentially acceptable to save democracy, it's this political culture that threatens to transform firearms from tools of hunting or self-defense into instruments of the kind of political liberalism on show on January 6th at the Capitol insurrection. So what this means is that gun owners and gun carriers do not simply believe in the Second Amendment like one might believe in the value of gun control. They enact it and they practice it as part of their everyday lives. And as much as gun politics is a matter of changing gun policy, it is also a matter of transforming civic culture, including the broader culture of democracy in which contemporary US gun culture exists. So for too many people in the US, this has entailed an embrace of anti-democratic tactics and the narrowing of the scope of political belonging. And this is something that maybe, or most certainly has been instigated from above, but it is also sustained from below. But because political culture is at the root of the crisis of US democracy, it also means that culture must be part of the solution. And that means that we need to think outside the box and consider what gun politics can tell us about the kinds of solutions we should be thinking with regard to co the contemporary crisis of US democracy. So given that with around probably 400 million to 450 million guns in circulation. Nobody actually knows how many guns are in circulation. Those are always just estimates, but there's more guns than people. We Americans have likely passed the point of no return with regard to the sheer presence of guns in US society. And so in unraveling what a more generative, productive, and inclusive democratic culture might and really must entail, 
I found myself coming to a counterintuitive set of questions based on the material reality that we in the US live with more guns than people. Can Americans learn to live with guns? Or put differently, if we can rehabilitate our democratic lives, how might we learn to better live with guns? And so coming to terms with this question is less about what the Second Amendment really meant to people like John Adams, who composed it or helped compose it, and more about what it means to those of us living today. And that's the conversation I hope to explore with you tonight. So thank you so much. Wonderful. All right. OK. Well, we'll start our conversation. And I promise that I will look into the audience after about 25 minutes or something and see if you have a burning question. So if you just squeak or do anything, I'll, uh, I'll look at you and thank you. Here we go. Yeah. Well, let me start off with a personal question. Do you still own the two guns you described in Citizen Protectors? Wow, we're <laughs> going right into it. Um, so I own my, I, I, you know, part of my research is not just talking to people, but actually trying to understand the many ways that people connect intimately with their firearms. And so I should probably explain like why I owned, <laughs> why, why I have guns uh, or why I, I, I acquired firearms in the course of Citizen Protectors. So that project was uh, my dissertation at UC Berkeley and it involved interviewing gun carriers, gun instructors, but also going through the process of uh, what, learning what it meant to carry a gun. So getting, you know, going through NRA training, going through the concealed pistol licensing process. Um, I also became an NRA certified instructor myself. I did not certify anybody to carry a gun, but the reason why I did that was because I wanted to understand sort of how people's moral universes with respect to firearms got shaped in these training spaces. So again, as you already mentioned, um, you know, the NRA, the National Rifle Association is often seen as sort of, you know, in this very one dimensional way as a political lobby organization. But the fact is more than a million people in the US go through NRA training and they most certainly learn about sort of the basic four rules of, of firearm safety. They learn how to manipulate a firearm, but they also get a, a sort of moral and legal education in terms of the limits and the, the responsibilities of self-defense and what it means to be the kind of person who carries a gun, who owns a gun, who would use a gun in self-defense. Uh, and so there's actually some, some of my favorite parts of, of Citizen Protectors is the, the quotes, the excerpts actually from the NRA training manuals mm. that very clearly lay out how, you know, the NRA sort of suggests if you do use a gun in self-defense, um, this is um, this is how you should think about yourself. You were a good person, you were a moral person, you saved yourself, you saved your family, you saved a lifetime of victims that this person would have victimized. Um, so really, um, you know, very individualistic, crime conscious, um, but personally empowering and moralistic way of, of thinking about this act of self-defense. And also I think really kind of implicitly acknowledging there's something deeply morally unsettling about this yeah. idea of, you know, of arming yourself somebody. with the the knowledge that you would potentially use that against a human being. Um, so that is why I, um, I, I, you know, became a gun owner. I, I actually owned a very small pistol, um, target pistol before that. Um, but I, I, yeah, the, the a carry target guns pistol were. would be something you use on a range, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like a 22. That's not for protection. It's not for protection, no. Okay. Yeah, a small, a small firearm. Um, but yeah, so I ended up, yeah, so I purchased gun. And, and the other piece of that I should also say is that I also learned very early on that having a gun, being a gun owner, this idea that gun ownership is a sign of good citizenship. I mean, I felt that very early on in my research when I had gun carriers ask me, well, do you own a gun or do you carry a gun? You're, you're driving around these streets, you have a gun, right? Like you're gonna be- <laughs> You're gonna be safe. You know, yeah, you're gonna be safe. And also with this kind of sense of if you're not the kind of person who values your safety enough to carry a gun, then maybe you're not gonna understand my project and my politics because I, I am that kind of person. So, you know, already sort of this, um, yeah, division, this kind of deeper division, moral division between the people who are willing to carry a firearm for self-defense versus would never, would never touch a gun. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Yeah, uh, I found it so interesting that you describe your I think I mentioned that your father is a very mm -hmm. conservative man, 
but you also write that this you were not you did not grow up in a pro gun household yeah there were no guns in your home yeah yeah so that's actually i think it's it's interesting my father like somehow just missed the memo on gun politics so like every other aspect of conservative uh, political culture he was right there i mean he was like fox news before fox news uh so yeah i mean very much gr growing up in a very uh yeah, very partisan household. Uh, you know, there's the Democrats are the, the bad guys, the Republicans are the good guys. He also referred to the Democrats as the Democrats. Uh, I think he thought he was very clever for coming yeah. up with that. <laughs> so, so yeah, there was, there was so much of that. Um, and as I read about it in the book, over time it was, you know, it, it became less like, uh, yeah, how are you gonna explain this to a six-year-old and much more politically divisive. Um, I got to a point where I really wasn't able to have a political conversation at all with my father, which is ironic because in some ways the very way, the very reason I was able to take on my father is because he, <laughs> he very much supported my education, supported, um, you know, sort of, he had a very sort of open mind with respect to um, culture and travel. So actually being here um, in Amsterdam is, a, is kind of a lovely experience. My father has passed away, by the way. So, and I write about this in the book, um, but he, he actually moved our family to Germany. And so we traveled all over Europe uh, when I was just out of high school. And so, you know, in some ways he, he wasn't at all the sort of, he didn't at all embrace the sort of isolationist Isol politics yeah, exactly. that um, I think really characterizes a lot of conservative thinking today. Um, and so part of what I do in the book is sort of end with his example, because even though, you know, by the time he died, I still hadn't figured out how to engage with him politically. And so in some ways, this book is an attempt to sort of wrestle with, with him and what he, I, he, by the way, was one of the votes in Michigan that turned Michigan red for Trump. Uh, that was uh, the last time he voted before he died. And so kind of grappling with him, but also grappling with the fact that he was the kind of conservative that was okay with, and yes, he referred to it as berserkly, but you know, he, he, his daughter, he, he was able to produce a daughter who got a sociology PhD at UC Berkeley, the you know, epicenter of all things liberal. Yeah. And so there's something there that I think, even though I grew up in, in what feels sometimes like the crash course that the rest of the country soon became privy to, um, I also feel got like- got an my, early start to that. Yeah, I got an early start, but I also feel like my father, and I'm still unraveling this, sort of provided an out uh, in terms of his, um, yeah, his, his ability to support me despite the fact that, you know, we could not ever actually have a political conversation okay. after, yeah, probably around age 20 for me, so. Uh, that yeah. it stopped, you mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I was wondering, but you say your father missed the memo. So mm -hmm. back then, are we talking about the 1990s? Well, in terms of gun politics being uh, pulled into the conservative agenda. Well, that was earlier, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, when we look, about, look at the National Rifle Association, this is an organization that has existed since the 1800s. Uh, it has played many roles. It's... Yeah you know, long been a politically engaged organization. Um, there's been a lot of ties between local law enforcement and the NRA, the US military and the NRA. These have shifted over time. But what happens in the 1960s is the NRA starts to sort of congeal around this hardline stance regarding gun, um, gun policy. And so then the 1968 Gun Control Act is passed. Um, this is kind of this galvanizing moment. And by the 1970s, the NRA, which again, they've done lobbying before, but by the time the 1970s roll around, they establish a explicit lobbying arm and really start um, you know, going down this path that we now, you know, w the result of which we now see as like the recognizably hard line, no compromise, Republican aligned National Rifle Association. Yeah. So, yeah. Any, any, uh, almost any thing they try to, to put on about gun control is for them a slippery slope. 
Yeah, so I think that's something that uh, this this idea of the slippery slope. So yeah. this idea that you any sort any measure of, would be any measure any quote unquote common sense like yeah. don't believe the words common sense exactly. because that's a that's a way to trick people into agreeing yeah. with a slippery slope that will necessarily end yeah. in, that will end in, in gun the guns. government taking your guns. Exactly, and I think what's really crucial about that in terms of pulling it into you know 2020 and mm -hmm. and sort of the contemporary politics that we're experiencing today is there's two things that that kind of um, forecasts. One, this sort of um, uh, conspiracist sensibility that, you know, you can't, there's shadowy forces working in the background, um, and this very hardline partisanship that liberals want your guns, or w want your guns, they, and I mean, these are like direct quotes from pro-gun media, you know, they, they hate you, they hate yeah. you for your guns, um, you cannot trust them, and so anything that seems reasonable or common sense, that's not the ultimate motive, and I think that's something that the NRA really makes explicit in the 1970s, it gets louder and louder, and and you know, then you know, today we have that's that's common sense in many circles, um, you know, in yeah. the US. So you interviewed 50 gun sellers for your book. How many of them were thinking along these lines that you the NRA lines? Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting you phrase it that way. So the gun sellers that I interviewed, by and large, were conservative. Um, the vast majority were conservative. There were um, a handful that were independent, and then there were three that identified as Democrat slash liberal. Uh, so those were a very all in California or what? Oh no, actually oh. they were um, oh. they were not all in California, okay. but yeah, they were. <laughs> but you you might think so, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's interesting you phrase that as like, are they on the NRA's kind of on the NRA's wavelength? And the NRA, so you know, the NRA obviously has played a big role in terms of shaping gun policy through their connections with the Republican Party and politicians, but they've also shifted the culture. They've shifted the culture of guns from hunting to self-defense. Um, they've introduced this, you know, hardline way of thinking about and relating to gun rights. And so that culture is definitely in the midst and I think is really something that the NRA um, it's kind of taken on a life of its own. But in terms of the NRA itself, what was interesting is that I, so I did not ask them about the NRA. I wasn't, you know, asking them about their opinions about the NRA. So if they brought it up, it was because they brought up the NRA. And they largely did not bring up the other, other than uh, the NRA as a training organization, they mostly brought up the NRA to complain about it, um, to ah. say that it was, you know, that, that they weren't doing enough, that they weren't doing enough for gun rights. Um, it they were corrupt? that they were corrupt, that they were taking their money. It might surprise people in this room to hear that um, many gun uh, owners, gun rights advocates, actually see the NRA as, um, uh, so the, the acronym they use is negotiate rights away. Oh. So they see the NRA as actually rolling back on this no compromise agenda. And so they see the NRA as sort of too middle of the ground, you know, of the road as compared to groups like Gun Owners of America. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it's actually interesting that, and, and the NRA actually uh, just had this, um, you know, this corruption trial that yeah. um, was wrapped up in the state of New York. They were found, you know, there's millions being pa paid back to the organization. And so the NRA is definitely not in, you know, as high as steam as it was, for example, yeah. in the 1990s. So does that mean that their opinions are grassroots opinions now? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's where I think people who uh, are critical of the NRA, who kind of oppose the NRA because they see that the NRA, you know, they view the NRA as hijacking the political process and preventing, you know, sensible gun control legislation. Um, they don't see the side of culture with respect to the NRA, the way that the NRA has transformed people's ways of, again, relating to yeah. gun rights and also relating to guns themselves. So through, you know, the training um, classes that I mentioned earlier, that the NRA really has done I mean, it's it's whether you love them or hate them, they have done a brilliant job of transforming the everyday reality of guns for Americans. Yeah. Wow. Um, so most people in this in this room wouldn't have been in America in 2020. There was a travel ban. Yeah. Could you take us back to the situation of the country when you started your interviews? In 2020. So I started my interviews in April of 2020, and. I like probably most everyone in this room, you know, we, we, we heard of this virus and then we're hearing more about this virus and suddenly 
the world shuts down. And so I think most of us were like, how, like, what am I going to do? Like, how do I make myself useful in this moment? And this is also the moment where I start seeing the headlines for, um, the, the headlines about gun sales just skyrocketing. That lines are out the door, something is happening, you know, gun sellers can't keep up with demand. And so I think, okay, well, I've been spending the last decade of my life studying this. This is my, this is what I can do to sort of capture this moment as an academic, as a, as a sociologist. And so what's interesting about 2020 in, in that very early moment, so this is before Black Lives Matter, um, you know, the, the, the resurgence of Black Lives Matter, this is before sort of this focus on election integrity kind of takes its grip on the American, um, on American politics. And it's really this moment where, for very briefly, nobody knows how to make sense of any of this. Nobody knows the, like soon, you know, masks get marked as, um, you know, leftist liberal scams. The CDC gets reviled by, you know, among conservatives. But it's not really clear at that very early moment what to make of this. And you even saw, and this is something that, if you go back to the, like, March, uh, headlines on pro-gun media. You can even see stories about gun manufacturers and uh, self-defense equipment manufacturers actually shifting their production to masks and um, sanitary and public health mm. equipment, which like I'm, <laughs> those have not been scrubbed yet, I don't think, mm. but it's very interesting because, you know, to, to imagine six months later even a gun company or a self-defense company saying, okay, we're going to, we're going to manufacture masks Mass. or, yeah. you know, ventilators or whatever uh, would not happen because the part in politics just became so ingrained so quickly. So that's the moment where I start interviewing gun sellers. And then basically throughout 2020, um, you know, as this partisan partisanization, I don't know if that's a word, but it's a process that I definitely saw unfold. As this happens, as um, the Black Lives Matter resurgence happens, the Defund yeah. the Police movement happens, um, you know, this is all, and, and at each of these moments, gun sales spike, spike, okay, spike. Okay, so you see actually a double spike in yes. 2020. First, when uh, the lockdowns start, and then when, uh, after the George, George Floyd killing and the Black Lives Matter protests. Yeah, so you actually see throughout 2020 and into 2021, like you see the spike and then it just kind of bounces throughout yeah. those, throughout that period. But gun sellers see it as qualitatively different. So they see, you know, there's the, the I need to have a sense of control, I need a guarantee, none of this makes sense. I can buy a gun, I can do something. And then by the time um, the protests happen, that's when um, gun sellers are telling me at least people are coming in because they're afraid of riots, of, of you know, yeah. protests going, and police can't protect us yeah. and, and all of this. Yeah. So. so is this, would this be a moment when you look at your research that all three things that you mentioned about conservative ideology, the armed individualism as a means to protect yourself, the, the ideas that people are, con the, the state is conspiring against American individuals, plus the, the partisan divide all come together? Yeah, yeah, I mean, this is what I see. So this is, this is actually the crux of the book, which is that, so when I'm talking to gun sellers, you know, and it's interesting because when you talk about guns, there's so many, there's so many questions and there's so many answers we want mm -hmm. to have about this subject, right? And so I, I try to always be really clear about, you know, who I'm talking to, what my data are, and what I can actually speak to. And what I can speak to with regard to these conversations I had with gun sellers was how they used these different, and I call them civic tools in the book, mm -hmm. these different tools to navigate the sort of contradictory tensions that they were confronting as they were selling guns, as they were trying to make sense of the pandemic, as they were trying to make sense of, um, you know, the protests and the uprisings and what have you. And so instead of um, sort of thinking of them as like ideologies, it was more that this was a way for them to sort of navigate um, navigate these different, different tensions, these different sources of uncertainty. Um, and so in, in the book, that's how I organize the book is, is you know, with each chapter is sort of a different civic tool. Yeah. And each of these kind of is a way to consolidate a particular understanding of what it means to be a good citizen and also what it means to relate to your to the state. And so with armed individualism, it's very much about, you know, obviously the willingness to use defensive force and also the awareness that the state is 
not going to be there to protect you and may actually be there to harm you. Um, you know, the uh, over overreach, underreach, um, that you're nobody's fool when it comes to the state. Um, the conspiracism part was actually, um, I mean, obviously a big part of this was, um, you know, state-oriented conspiracism. But what was interesting with the gun sellers that I interviewed was that it was less about, I mean, they had, you know, there was lots of different conspiracy theories that came up throughout uh, 2020 and, and, and yeah. continue. Um, but what's interesting, and I think this is really indicative of this contemporary moment in, the, in American politics, is that you know, there, conspiracy theories, I think, at one point were like, you know, what's the explanation for this thing that we can't understand? Like, who killed JFK? There's like a plot. Like, there's there's some truth out there, and like the conspiracy, the conspiracy, the conspiracy theorist is going to find out what that truth is. And that was actually not so much how conspiracy thinking emerged in my interviews. It was more this sense of just sort of like lionized skepticism ah. that I don't need, I'm not believing any of this. I know that it's, pro, you know, it's the liberals and the liberal elites are behind it, whether they're in the CDC, in universities, in Or in media. China itself. Yeah, yes, yeah. But even that, I mean, there yeah. was definitely some of that like global conspiracy sort yeah. of sens sensibilities. But that was actually second seat to these this just general sense of i don't i don't i don't know who to believe and so i'm going to kind of make a virtue out of that i'm going to make a virtue out of that and actually say that the fact that i don't believe any of this I am, that, that's my brand of sort of almost this like epistemological individualism mm -hmm. that as an individual, I know this is, I know not to believe the, you know, the lies on CNN and MSNBC and what have you. And so uh, what I argue about, uh, argue in the book is that it actually has this like very um, sort of elective affinity between, um, you know, guns as tools of personal protection and, and sort of self-possessed individualism to be a conspiracy, you know, to kind of think in conspiracist terms is really to reassert the individual as yeah. the primary seat of, of yeah. knowledge. Yeah. I make up my own truth. I know. I Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So um, what do you think, if you look back, would be the main driver, um, or is it difficult to say, mm -hmm. of these three uh, of, of those two spike moments, the lockdowns with the government reaching mm -hmm. into your private life, which they did, of course, yeah. uh, or, the, um, or the fear of the Black Lives Matter protest. I, I ask this because uh, I lived in the United States back then, and um, we had a dear friend, my wife and I, a member of our family, and she was really, really scared mm -hmm. that black protesters would go out to get her. She was like, in panic mode. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so is it the coronavirus? Is it Black Lives Matter? Think? Yeah. I, you know, I think. It's, or is it just one? Yeah. I mean, I, I think, I think what was different about the Black Lives Matter protests in terms of galvanizing, um, gun purchasing. Well, so there's a couple of things to, to unpack with that. One was the people who were buying guns because they were afraid of protesters. And so we, you know, the, the case of Kyle Rittenhouse is like the paradigmatic yeah. case of, you know, uh, this yeah. white teenager basically bringing an AR-15 to a Black Lives Matter protest, getting praised by law enforcement, and then shooting three protesters, yeah. killing two of them, and then basically being acquitted, essentially as his actions being deemed by yeah. the state self-defense. And now he's a hero on the concert. Yeah, and now side. he's be doing speaking circuits, yeah. And, and all of these things. So, um, so, so that was definitely. I mean, that that thread is definitely there. Um, there was also, um, you know, Black Lives Matter chapters who were basically saying, you know, hey, we see what the police are doing. We're not dialing nine one one. Who are we to depend on the police? And if Kyle Rittenhouse and people like Kyle Rittenhouse are arming themselves. Why are we not taking advantage of this of this legal ability to own guns and protect ourselves as well? So there were there is a lot going on in terms of the Black Lives Matter protests and the relationship to um, gun purchasing. Um, but as far as um, you know, sort of connecting Black Lives Matter or sort of comparing Black Lives Matter to coronavirus as a driver, mm -hmm. I think at the end of the day. You know, I, I, I do, and again, like we can unpack sort of the politics of race and white supremacy, which are absolutely a conversation we should have if we want to go there. But I do think that both of those moments and then the election instability and, and, and all of that that obviously culminated in January 6th, I think this sense of exactly what Robert said about this, 
the, the sense of needing a guarantee, needing yeah. some sense of control. And again, not from the back, I mean, the, the state of things that people are dealing with are not, you know, there's, there's no sense of the government is going to not even like be, po but it's even going to be effective or competent. This is at a moment where public trust is plummeting across the board. And, you know, sort of by design, the U.S. government is becoming more and more dysfunctional. And so I think, you know, it's hard to parse those things out because in a way they kind of all lead to the same conclusion, yeah. which is that guns become almost this last, st you know, this stopgap yeah. social safety net. When you're on your own. Yeah. As he says, right? Yeah. Robert. So... Uh, from a from a business perspective, I would say your interviewees would be very very happy that year. They, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if they got rich, but mm -hmm. they got richer than the year before, obviously. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point, also, because a lot of people don't realize that gun sales actually plummeted during Trump. So. Mm -hmm the kind of inside gun industry yeah. joke is that Obama was the greatest gun salesman yeah. because basically 2008 happens, yeah. gun sales spike, and they yeah. never, I mean, they still have not gone below 2008 levels. Yeah. But then Trump gets in office, he gets elected, everybody thinks Hillary Clinton is gonna be elected, next morning, stock market opens, gun, the, the gun manufacturers, all of their stocks plummet because... Because Trump won? Because Trump won. Be because there's no threat. So, and the threat, is being that the government will take away your gun rights, right? The threat is that Hillary Clinton will take your AR-15 yeah. and take all your other guns. So you have to stock up guns mm -hmm. before she's yeah. she she fulfills her plans. Exactly. Ah, okay. So, um, but you see that some of your salespersons, uh, uh, gun sellers, are not particularly happy with the new breed of customers mm -hmm. in the first wave of. 2020, yeah. because they're liberals, the guy in the Bernie Sanders mm -hmm. t-shirt. Um, what do they do? Because as salesperson, they should embrace the new customers, of course, and mm -hmm. say, welcome to the family. And maybe even as an ideologist, they would think, well, now you're part of the responsible U Americans, right? But they don't. Yeah, so there definitely is this sort of uh, tension there where you have people like Andrew that I quoted who are very much of the idea that, you know, everybody everybody should have a gun, everybody should exercise this right to self, you know, self-defense. Empowerment. But, but not, yeah, it's not just self-defense, it's, it's, it's a brand, a means of political empowerment. And, you know, for some gun sellers, it very much was, you know, this is sort of like the gateway to this broader awakening. And so I have a little, when I, when I do a PowerPoint slide of this presentation, or I, I do the PowerPoint of this presentation, I have a slide that has this quote that says, awake but not woke. Oh, yeah. And I think that absolutely captures this sort of sentiment of, you know, this will be a way for people to realize that they can do, I have a gun seller who says, they can do really brave things. You know, they can, they can, you know, they can do, they can, they can be empowered, right? And so there's that set of sort of that that sentiment, but then there's this other sentiment, which is that, you know, liberals are going to do stupid things with guns. They don't, they're unsafe. Uh, and if they're going to decide that they're going to be gun owners, they need to start voting like gun owners. And so you oh, really? can't be a liberal with, a, yeah. like being a liberal gun owner is an oxymoron. Yeah. Okay. And well, so I think there's, so yeah. I think there's this tension where, and this is something that I think is, is unfolding if you read sort of the comment sections, which you never should, but this, in this case, if you read them on, you know, on gun news organization, uh, or sorry, gun news um, stories, pro gun news stories, you'll Amo see, Land. yeah, Amoland, like Truth About Guns, Bearing Arms, yeah. you'll see this tension playing out of, you know, is it an inherent universal right or is it for the real Americans? And yeah. it's very interesting to see this sort of at play. And so I think 2020 is sort of this really acute window into this phenomenon. So what, what side did your gun sellers take? Uh, well, so this is actually why I introduced this, uh, the sort of typology of political imaginations at the end of the book. So laying out these different ways of thinking about political belonging, political inclusion. And so I had the libertarian imagination, which was very much this sort of optimistic, this is a, you know, guns are a means of people awakening to their personal empowerment. 
I had the illiberal imagination, which was very much sort of the, you know, make America great again, sort of narrowing a liberal understanding of citizenry, the embrace of anti-democratic tactics, like a show of, you know, as things like one gun, gun seller said, you know, a show of force works. So that kind of mentality. Uh, and then I had the eclectic imagination, which was my three liberal gun sellers. <laughs> so they had their, they got their own thing. Um, but was, what was interesting about them is that they were, so across the board, and really I think this is the case across the political spectrum in the U.S. and even beyond gun politics, which is that people in the U.S. are very, very suspicious of the state. They have, they are critical of the state, and, you know, there are many reasons to be critical of yeah. the U.S. I mean, we could have another session on that. Uh -huh. um, and so I don't think sort of this idea that, you know, the police are not going to be there to protect you, that, um, you know, you can't rely on the state. That's not something that is a conservative-only sentiment, even though it's being mobilized and weaponized in particular ways uh, by conservatives in the U.S. And so across the board, you know, even the three liberals were like, yeah, this is, you know, this, this is definitely part of this project that we buy into. But what was interesting was that they really broke with... Um, the idea that there is nothing that the state can do. So one of the ways that I talk about armed individualism is about that it's not just sort of embracing guns, but it's sort of viewing all social problems through the lens of what guns can solve. Yeah. So this idea that, um, yeah, kind of like if you have a hammer, every uh, problem looks like a Comes nail. A nail. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so this idea that there might just be some kinds, kinds of problems that you just can't solve with fire, that, and that need to be solved, problems that need, um, you know, a collective apparatus to solve. And so that was where the liberal gun, gun sellers were much more aware of, like, look, sometimes you just need to wear masks. Yeah. Like, sometimes you just have to do something inconvenient. You just have to follow the public health guidance. So yeah. I think that, and then they also very much broke with the conspiracist uh, and partisan thinking. So it's, maybe it's difficult here in this group of people, and especially with me, because it's hard for me to imagine what the conservative gun sellers mm -hmm. think a gun can solve. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are social problems. Mm -hmm. Do they mean that you just have to fire your guns at migrants at the southern border? Is that it? Or is it, <laughs> is it something abstract? Yeah, I just mean, the, the, the way to defend yourself. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, part of this is also wrapped up in this idea of um, what legal scholar Jonathan Simon calls governing through, the, through crime. So this idea that increasingly social problems in the U.S. have been framed as problems of crime. As so criminal problems. Immigration is a problem of crime. Yeah. School discipline is a problem of crime. Social welfare, it's... It's crime. And so that's where sort of this linkage happens, where if, if all of our social problems are really, really come down to problems of crime, then we need mass incarceration, more police, and people owning guns. And so that's sort of how the linkage um, works. That being said, though, you know, I do want to be clear that gun sellers, they weren't like, oh, yeah, you know, a pandemic can be solved with, with guns. No. Um, you know, they weren't, they, they, a few of them even joked about, you know, you can't shoot a virus, like we <laughs> know that. Um, but still there was this sense of there's, there's nothing else that works, and so this is, you know, this is the go-to tool. This is the last yeah. refuge. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I get this funny feeling because I was... I was there, and, and you talk about Kyle Rittenhouse, who, who mm. shot three people and killed two. Um, I remember being in a protest the same year, the, a month later even, in Louisville, Kentucky, and there were protests about a woman who was shot by the police while she was just lying in her bed. And Brianna the police, Taylor. Yeah, Brianna Taylor. And those were, uh, the protests there were very, very agitated. People were very, very upset and very loud. And they were mostly black protesters. Mm -hmm. And they were carrying semi-automatic rifles to their demonstration. I have never been more scared than at that moment. Mm -hmm. I thought if the police are shooting unarmed black people mm -hmm. in a traffic stop, what will they do to this, to this group mm -hmm. shouting at them? It's almost a miracle that no more people have been killed in 2022, uh, 2020, or is that a very blasphemous thing to say? 
Oh, that, I mean, I think this point, and, and this is when I feel like it's like, you know, when you talk to audiences, to people who are very disconnected from the reality of, of guns in America, uh, and this may even be people within the U.S., like academics, I think, are often very disconnected um, in a variety of ways. And I think there's this, like, you you know the, the sort of, there's this, like, kind of light turning on moment when people realize I mean, the stats are horrific. The number of people killed are just the beginning. Yeah. There's the people who are wounded, who hear gunshots, who are exposed to gun violence. Yeah. I mean, it's massive. But at the same time, you know, the fact that there are hundreds of millions of guns, I yeah. mean, there is also the sense of it's actually shocking there's not more gun violence, right? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that is, um, yeah. And even January 6th, I mean, the, 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 the whole there was a horrible aggression uh, on the Capitol uh, stairs and only one person was shot. Mm -hmm. I was surprised that no more people were firing guns there. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I think that there- They brought guns into town. Yeah, they brought guns into town. They, my understanding is that guns were not brought into the actual yeah. insurrection, yeah, yeah. Well, may, let's see, how, what time is it? Um, maybe I should ask you, People keep asking me what I think will happen in, in November, who will win. Maybe I should ask you what you think um, will happen after somebody wins, mm. one of the two. Uh, given the, the, uh, the tendency towards approving of political violence, mm -hmm. we've seen a lot of violent protesting uh, since Trump was not elected president. Mm -hmm. uh, are, you, are you afraid of something of that kind? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a really, really heavy question to answer. Um, and I do think it matters who's, who is elected um, and how, that, uh, how the election unfolds. There's so many unknowns. Um, I think that what is a little troubling um, to me is that, you know, we have really, with the last sort of, um, spate of Supreme Court decisions um, with respect to the insurrection clause, um, you know, the, the trial, the, you know, all, all sorts of things yeah. that, that the Supreme Court is now having to, to adjudicate on. Um, we're really uh, losing all those guardrails. Um, the guardrails are being removed. And so as far as um, political violence, I do think, um, you know, what, and I'll, I'll just, I'll use this as my illustration. Um, you know, there is obviously, a, you know, a massive effort being done with respect to the, the January 6th insurrectionists to, um, you know, bring them to trial. They've been convicted. They, you know, I mean, it's, it's a massive amount. Every time I updated the book, I revised the book. I had to mm. go back and look at how many, <laughs> how yeah. many arrests had been made. And I know that it's woefully out of date, um, yeah. you know, now. But, you know, this is also counterbalanced by the fact that uh, Trump at his rallies are now, he's now actually starting his rallies with a salute to what he calls the January 6th hostages. So treating them as political prisoners and really getting that sort of narrative, uh, maybe not into the public mind because uh, most mainstream uh, media that I'm seeing is not reporting on this, which for better or for worse, um, but definitely getting that narrative into the minds of his followers. And yeah. so I think that that is, extremely troubling, and um, I think that says a lot in terms of what could happen and what's on the table. Yeah. Okay, well, I did want to end on a, on a pessimistic note, so let's get some questions in the, in the audience. Joshua, there are people, two questions, and I would like to, to ask you to have a short question for Ms. Carlson. Oh, thank you. Firstly, Jennifer, thank you for coming to see us in Amsterdam. I have two points that I'm curious about. One is, is there any statistical data to suggest that guns make you safer? Does anybody actually do that, use a gun to defend themselves in a criminal situation? And my other question is, what is the role of race? Is it harder for dark-skinned people to get a gun from these people whom you interviewed? than for white people? Well, wonderful questions, thank you. 
Yeah, those are great questions. So um, yeah, the statistical data. So this question of do more guns equal more crime, do more guns equal less crime, um, that is definitely a question that criminologists and socio-legal scholars and public health scholars have interrogated a great deal. Um, and so the public health data, you know, their analysis are that you know, having a gun in your home um, increases your risk of being the victim of, of, of gun harm, uh, whether that's gun negligence, whether that's gun homicide. Um, there's also the question of what is the relationship between just gun availability and uh, you know, how many guns are out there and what are the rates of gun crime. Um, there has been some back and forth with that involving a scholar named John Lott who kind of popularized this notion of more guns equal less, more guns, less crime. Um, but by and large, the, the, the analysis coming out of, um, you know, legal public health criminology uh, scholarship is that, you know, gun, they're at, they are asking that question and they're coming up with, you know, guns are, um, yeah, they're, they're um, criminogenic or harmful. Um, um, now, as far as this question about using guns to, how often guns are being used to, for people to defend themselves, um, this is an interesting question. Well, so the, the answer in terms of like FBI crime statistics is that I think around 200 to 300 people use guns to commit what is called justifiable homicide. So that every year. So that is um, basically the legal term for self-defense, a self-defense shooting. What is pertinent though is that gun criminologists will also say that the amount of times that guns are used to stop a crime or for someone to defend themselves, that number actually vastly underestimates it because people may brandish, people may pull a gun. And so those numbers, and this is actually, the CDC has a fascinating report where they're like, you know, we can't actually say, you know, precisely how often this happens, but it does seem to happen a lot. So it kind of comes down to this question of what, it's, it's a pick your poison kind of question of the risk of living in a society where there are lots of gun controls, but you don't, and, and so you don't have the ability to defend yourself if you quote unquote need to use your gun versus the risk of having a gun and having something harmful happen as a result of that firearm. Okay, here's how I take it though, in terms of a sociologist, um, a sociological perspective, which is that there's the question of, you know, what do the data, what, what do data say versus what do people believe about what their guns are doing for them? And what I think is really fascinating and pertinent is that if you look over the course of the last two or three decades, it used to be the case when people in the US were asked, does a gun make you safer or less safe? Does you know, widespread concealed carry among licensed individuals, does that make society safer? Um, you know, does a gun in the home make, make you, your home more safe or less safe? People, about two thirds would say, so definitely in the majority would say, guns make us less safe. Having guns around does not make us safer, it makes life more dangerous. Those numbers have basically flipped. And so now, and this is not because of some, you know, massive shift in the public health consensus. Um, now, two thirds of people in the US say, guns make us more safe. Mm -hmm. Having people conceal carry makes society safer. And so I think that is really kind of the crucial, like, uh, you know, the question beyond the question, you know, the answer beyond the answer in terms of what um, people are not just, you know, not just what the facts are, but what people are doing with the facts and how that shapes and intersects with their politics. Um, and then that also is an interesting question uh, to bring that back to the role of race. Um, so my, I talked to gun sellers. I was not um, in the gun stores. I was not watching them. And so I have no idea what they were actually doing. When they told me about who they were selling guns to, they by and large told me that they were, you know, they, I mean, literally using the word delight, you know, at selling guns to people who are out of the category of sort of the white conservative, you know, guy who owns a few guns. So by their own admission, they definitely saw themselves as the kinds of people who wanted everybody to be armed. Of course, liberals were the one, you know, asterisk on that. Um, but then the question is like, you know, obviously we know, I mean, the data on race uh, with respect to and, and this is a, I, I think this is a really, um, you know, the illustration that always comes to my mind is uh, what is called the weapons bias. So the idea that uh, if someone is presented with, um, you know, an unidentified, you know, an ambiguous object and it's connected to a white face versus a darker skinned face, 
it will be seen as a gun in, you know, alongside the darker skin face, that there is this sort of um, ability to see a gun that isn't there when it comes to um, people of color. And so this is obviously, I mean, this is the, the I mean, so many cases yeah. that have unfolded um, with respect to the criminalization of blackness, not just by the police, but also by private um, armed General civilians. Public, yeah. yeah, who see, um, see um, people of color as threats and as uh, particularly as uh, if they're armed. Um, and this is obviously Philando Castile, who was stopped yeah. by a police officer, African-American father, uh, cafeteria supervisor. Um, he was driving, um, you know, driving in a suburb, gets stopped and basically says, I am legally armed. I'm going to pull out my, fi I'm going to pull out my, sorry, not my firearm. I'm going to pull out my driver's license. license. And then he gets shot dead on the spot. Um, and so what I found, and this is really my book, uh, Policing the Second Amendment, which is all about sort of the, the relationship with guns, uh, between guns and race and public law enforcement, uh, is most certainly that this idea about who's a good guy versus a bad guy is, yeah. is absolutely informed by race. But what I found, and I think this is what really answers your question most directly, is that it wasn't the process by which that happened wasn't quite in the way that I expected or that I think many people expect it or expect, which is that in some ways the concealed pistol license or the gun is actually itself used as a mechanism of control and policing. So I observed gun licensing procedures for uh, basically people who had a concealed pistol license or applied for a concealed pistol license and their license was revoked or um, denied or suspended. And so I saw a whole broad range of people basically come to this board, this was in Michigan, uh, basically making their, their claim for why they should get this license back. And what was very striking was that it, it was very obvious that white claimants and African American claimants were undergoing very different. They had to um, they had to account to very different sets of expectations mm -hmm. with respect to that gun license. So, to the extent of, for example, African American claimants being told, if you get stopped, the officer like you should understand that the officer is going to see you as a threat, and you need to like and basically quizzing them on the spot about like how are you going to show the officer you're not a threat? How are you going to put the officer at ease? Things that were never done with respect to white um, white claimants. Um, so absolutely, this is definitely part of of what is um, part of what's animating this politics, um, and in, in somewhat unexpected ways. Yeah. So Goodman with a gun for most parts, seem to be a white man with a gun in the conservative imagination. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think that's where that split between the libertarian and the illiberal yeah, kind of, of imagination yeah. really comes into yeah. play. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I saw another uh, question, two more questions here. Thank you. Um, I was wondering about the partisanship of those liberals who did get guns, um, despite the gun sellers. Does their liberalism intensify? Does their partisanship intensify when they get guns? Um, does it contribute to polarization in, in, in that sense? Mm -hmm. um, even to the extent they, I mean, having shot guns in my, in my national military service, I feel the, the individual empowerment that you get from a gun. So I can imagine that even a liberal will get this empowerment, feel this empowerment, um, and become almost an illiberal liberal, perhaps, mm -hmm. at one point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. That's their dream. <laughs> Yeah, I think that is like the million or billion dollar question right now is like what actually is happening to the, and this is actually something I asked all of the gun sellers, like what's going to happen to these new gun owners? Are they going to be, you know, vibrant gun rights activists? Are they going to sell their guns? Are they going to keep their guns but kind of forget about them? Are they going to come to the conservative side? What What is going to happen? Um, and I got a, a wide range of sort of predictive answers about that. The social science on this is actually starting to, to come out. So I did not interview liberal gun owners that purchased guns in 2020. I, I for a variety of reasons, I didn't do that. Um, but what I'm seeing is that it's it does seem like it's a bit of a mixed bag in terms of their attitude. So on the one hand, there's data that's, that's come out that suggests that uh, the new gun owners of 2020 and 2021 actually in terms of things like concealed pistol licensing, um, arming teachers, like 
a variety of sort of gun policy or gun rights agenda items actually are very similar to existing gun owners. So there's some suggestion that actually maybe, um, you know, they're, they're not so different. And what I think is really important to sort of contextualize that is that in the US, a third, roughly a third of adults own firearms personally. And so that's often presented as like one third own gu owns guns, two thirds do not own guns, as if that's a binary, but it's actually not a binary. So one third owns guns, one third is like, I don't own, own guns and I'm never gonna own a gun, I do not want a gun. And there's another, th that last third is actually people who, they don't own guns presently, but they are open to owning guns. They could see themselves possibly buying a gun in the future. And so I think that is possibly what's going on there, that they're actually, that, that maybe the conversion isn't as dramatic as maybe, Maybe we think it is. Um, and then the other piece of that is that there's actually been some um, sort of online ethnographic work done on liberal gun owners and you know discussion boards online about how um, liberal gun owners are thinking about themselves and their politics. And very much in line with sort of what I saw with the liberal gun sellers, there's much more of sort of a community-oriented ethic with respect to uh. gun ownership. And I think this is really interesting because we're seeing this get articulated in different spaces within the sort of quote unquote pro-gun arena. So uh, for example, the son of Stuart Rhodes, uh, who is the founder of the Oath Keepers, who is you know, a, con a convicted, convicted criminal, criminal yeah, of, yeah. after January 6th, uh, his son, the whole family has been basically separated from him in 2018. And his son is actually a gun owner. He's, you know, lives in Montana. He's actually running for office in the state of Montana right now. And he's not running as like, you know, anti-gun, you know, eschewing all that. He's actually running on the plat, well, one of his, pl not his only platform, but, you know, sort of running on this idea that gun ownership th should not be connected to, and this is a paraphrase of his, his words, you know, this egotistical, Indivi hyper individualistic culture. It needs to be refocused on this sort of community, community oriented, responsible, but in sort of a deep sense, responsible gun ownership. And I think that's super fascinating because it's again, it, it gets us to this question of, you know, if we're living with guns, then what is what is a gun culture that's compatible with democracy? And I think that's where I think the liberal gun owners could be a space where that gets articulated. Mm. Very interesting. One more question, if somebody, yeah, this gentleman was first, I'm sorry. We have drinks afterwards. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for so many insights uh, in your presentation. In particular, I find it quite uh, fascinating this, um, uh, that many, many groups of people perceive uh, uh, other citizens with guns as responsible citizens as a uh, one who think about the safety etc so uh, it, it seems there is a lot of symbolism in guns uh, like uh, uh, self-empowerment uh, good citizen safeness etc etc and my question is how do you think or maybe how do you feel are guns uh, essential or maybe are guns important in sustaining democracy in America mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's hard to answer that question because, and it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful, perfect question to end on because I think it's very, it's very hard to imagine a, a United States without guns. I think that's really, um, really what it comes down to. And, you know, part of it is because it is the case that even though it's conservative dominated in terms of gun ownership, even though it's very much, you know, intertwined with, conservative politics with respect to the, mm. the, you know, the Republican Party, it's, you know, the relationship, and I think there's, again, there's so much we could say about the Second Amendment and sort of how the Second Amendment has been invigorated over the past six decades, but I think we can look at guns throughout American history and see that even though there is this, um, you know, absolute sort of trend of guns as, as assertions of power. Um, there are also moments where guns emerge as spaces where groups like the Black Power, you know, the, the Black Panthers embrace mm -hmm. firearms and this becomes a means of, um, you know, of, of resistance empowerment. and empowerment and, and actually not the um, individual empowerment necessarily, but community empowerment. But, you know, there's a lot to, there's a lot to say about that and unpack that. But I think that it does, um, you know, guns do really have 
this um, arresting quality on the American imagination. But I think the bigger issue, and I think this is something that I don't think the sort of gun violence prevention, I think we're starting to sort of really grapple with just the sheer reality of how many guns there are in the US. Um, it is not, uh, it, it, you know, the, for all the rhetoric surrounding slipper, the slippery slope and mm -hmm. gun confiscation, it is very difficult to imagine how you, like gun confiscation as being a reality. And, and the fact is too that, you know, even like people are like, but there's gun buybacks and there's things like this. I mean, police, I mean, gun buybacks in the US are generally PR. Yeah. Um, they're, they're a way to sort of drum up PR for a particular, you know, for whatever, um, you know, whatever, you know, a, pu public law enforcement will have these like, you know, big displays of the guns yeah. that they, they bought back in the, you know, in the gun buyback program and what have you. But, you know, as far as actually impacting gun violence, they're really not, um, they're not effective. So I think this idea of, yeah, it's, it's, I would, so I guess what the way, <laughs> the way I would love to respond to this is that I don't think that's a question that we can, we're quite ready to ask in the U.S. I think we have, we're, we're, we're set with a set of other kinds of questions that we, we must grapple with before we can get to that question. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jennifer. You You've um, delighted us with your insights and uh, your wonderful analysis of um, how American culture is shaped by this, this object that uh, is so foreign to many people. But uh, thank you again. I'm looking forward to your next book. And uh, it'll be about guns, but gun trauma, right? Yeah. OK. Thank right. you so much. Thank Jennifer you all. Carson. Here, no, I do it here. Uh, and now I can ask Jackie Ashkin, spoken word, um, to address us. And um, I characterized uh, Jennifer as a ethnographer, and I find it fascinating that you are an uh, anthropologist, so we get very sensible uh, ideas about uh, guns and what have you tonight. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you so much, Bas, for that lovely introduction. And thank you, Jennifer, for all your wonderful insights this evening. Um, I have two pieces that I'm going to share with you guys tonight. And the first thing that came to mind when Ian called me and said, we're doing this event on guns was, oh boy. Um, the second thought that I had was that there's this uh, lovely aphorism from the writer Anton Chekhov where he says, if you start a story with a gun, it always has to go off by the end of it. So this piece is based on this. It's called Chekhov Tells the Taliban the Revolution is Over. The gun must go off by the end of the story. But still, there is always an after. After the revolt, after the revolution, after the death and the dying and the gunshots and the guillotines, after the vagaries of the illiberal and the ignorant, after, 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 after all this comes many things. But mostly paperwork. Desk jobs, committees, forms, and long hallways filled with glaring fluorescent lights forms of government and forms for getting passports. Driver's licenses renewed. No one even likes the shiny blue and gold cover colors. Thankful work this is. The small ways life changes. The new brands of cooking oil and the corner shop cashier who won't quite look you in the eye. When you check out the passport, you see that the mascot is mangy, skinny, hungry, even starving. Your pride and your patriotism are empty calories to the beast. All doom and no bloom in this, our summer of dissident content. Too bad mascots can't live off VAT. 
inflation, IMF loans, the way the government men do. Funny how they gain weight in any economy. Funny how your pants don't fit quite like they used to. Funny, hilarious, even in this, the worst of times, it is the worst of times. The gun must go off by the end of the story, and still there is always an after. After the revolt, after the revolution, after the death and the dying and the guns and the guillotines, after, 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 after all of this comes many things, but mostly paperwork desk jobs and forms and committees, and by God, it is boring. Thank you. So this piece, has anyone here been to a wet market before? Yeah? Are you familiar with kind of the chaos and the yelling? There's people everywhere and they're hawking their wares and this guy wants you to buy his fish and that guy wants you to buy his vegetables and it's very loud and lively and the sellers have a certain tone that they take on. So I'd like you to imagine me reading this in the tone of a seller at a wet market. Organic militants. Come get your homegrown, free-range militants. None of that foreign business. We don't send ours overseas for training. We do it here ourselves. We perpetuate a system that disenfranchises the young and alienates the old, forces men into echo chambers and women into silence. What is not to love? Organic militants, come and get your organic militants. Have you had too much free speech lately. Do you feel like all this democracy business is really getting out of hand? Are those people you don't like campaigning for equality again? Then our collection of organic, free-range militants might just be for you. Not yet convinced? Try our installment plan. For only $10.99 a month, we'll accelerate the neoliberalization of your nation state so that you can blame the wrong parties for your systemic oppression guilt-free. Organic militants, try it today. Support your local corner militants for the small price of xenophobia, racism, sexism, impending civil war, or even your feeling of safety when you go to the grocery store. Please note, side effects may include nausea, white supremacy, vomiting, dizziness, social collapse, the urge to tear your hair out, constipation, awkward family dinners, depression, diarrhea, and in some cases, death. If in doubt about whether organic militants are right for you, don't consult your doctor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, a really wonderful and kind of thought-provoking way to end an evening full of lots of good information. Um, I think what really stuck with me was when Jennifer said that culture also must be part of the solution. And I think that your work and what we're all doing here tonight is also hopefully a small step together in the right direction. Um, so thank you for your enlightening, thoughtful, and, and also thought-provoking approach. We appreciate you making the journey all the way over to Amsterdam for seeing us. And uh, for the rest of you, Jennifer will be available to sign books, and books will be for sale uh, in just a few moments, thanks to our longtime friends at the Ateneum Buchhandel. So please go say hello to them and purchase this book. A special and heartfelt thanks also to Remco Hunhauser of the Movenpick Hotel for his generosity in hosting Jennifer. We are very pleased to count you among our friends. And to Jennifer's publishers also at Princeton University Press, sadly unable to be with us here tonight, but I work on a lot of programs with the wonderful Kate and Katie, and uh, they are forces to be reckoned with. So if you watch this live or this later, thank you. Um, a little bit more from us at the John Adams Institute before we head to book signing and drinks. 
On a personal note, it is Joshua Cowgill's final week at the John Adams Institute, and we would like to wish him well in his future endeavors, of which we are sure there will be many successes. Joshua is headed back to the great state of Utah after being our faithful intern since January, and we're really grateful for his efforts to support our work, as well as keeping us all young and forward-thinking while doing so. We hope you've enjoyed your time here as much as we've enjoyed hosting you. So, bon voyage, Joshua, and we hope to see you again soon. I also wanted to highlight two upcoming events. On April 23rd, we will be welcoming Democracy's cyber defendant, Yael Eisenstadt, for a talk on how elections both around the world and in the United States are increasingly under threat due to online extremism, generative AI, and advanced algorithms. You may know Yael's name. She worked at Facebook briefly in 2018 as their head of global elections integrity for political ads. And when she realized there was little integrity within the organization, she exposed just how dire things really were at the social media giant. Yael is now a senior policy analyst at Cybersecurity for Democracy. And she will be joined on stage that evening by artists Anna Zibelnik and Jakob Gonselmeyer, whose new exhibit on these topics, Giga, has just premiered at FOAM, Amsterdam's premier photography museum. So we're looking forward to combining all of those perspectives together on the 23rd of April. And we are also thrilled to welcome award-winning poet Terence Hayes for an evening of poetics and politics on the 27th of May, together with Amsterdam's International Writers Collective. Terence has won a MacArthur grant and a host of other literary honors and brought out a really remarkable bundle of poems called American Sonnets for My Past and Future Assassins. He was writing those poems in the first 200 days of the Trump presidency. And we'll be talking to him about the role that art plays in helping make sense of the world around us, certainly in trying times, uh, as well as taking the current political temperature of the nation. So don't worry if you're no poetry buff, I'm not either. Just come dive into the world as Terence Hayes sees it. And I promise you won't be disappointed. I've even organized some jazz for you to start and <laughs> end the evening. Um, but of course, if you can't wait until the end of April, don't forget to listen to our podcast, read our blogs, or check out our multi-year project, The New Anthology. You can find all of that and much more on our website. And thank you all for joining us tonight, in particular our sponsors, members, family, friends, and patrons. Lots of familiar faces in the audience tonight, and we are very grateful to have you all here. And we can't wait to see you all again soon. So have a wonderful rest of your evening, and thank you for joining us. Thank you.